Around Australia, a battle is raging. And for three years, the manor was on its front line. Until December 2009, it housed a rehab facility called the Victorian Addiction Centre. I can't really, I can't cope anymore, like... For two months prior to the centre's relocation, a single camera was given unprecedented access. It was all my fault. <laughs> my parents tried so hard to give me everything. To capture the pain, hope and recovery of its final intake of addicts. I'm going to be dead. I'll think about you. Everyone here is a normal person. But they just have a disease of addiction. These gamblers, drinkers and drug users are also mums, dads, sons and daughters. And these are their stories. If I don't stop using and drinking, I'll be dead before April next year. Last time on Addiction, four addicts finished their program and left the manor. In this episode, we'll be following their progress outside as they battle to keep their addiction in check. This is where the stuff I've learned needs to be put into action. So it's um, gonna be a test. We'll also be observing the last month of therapy at the Victorian Addiction Centre in Ivanhoe. She has no right to change my medication. It's Thursday morning, and a small group of addicts are beginning a new day at the manor. What time did you speak to her about? Two minutes ago. Rehab here means 28 days of no booze, no drugs, and no trips outside the gates without supervision. I like to look at it as one ugly version of Big Brother. But we're all fucking addicts. Okay, push me over, mate. Push, 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 push. There are daily workouts. All right, excellent. Good, mate. Followed by group therapy sessions, both designed to help break the cycle of addiction. We use uh, psychological treatments. So things like cognitive behavioural therapy and mindfulness are very important ways in which people can understand their illness and change their behaviours. Yeah. That's a big one, isn't it? Today, Councillor Marco Keo sets the residents the task to write a letter to their addiction. It's almost like a Dear John letter. It's almost like you're, you're saying goodbye to it. Saying goodbye to active addiction. Yeah. But for 24-year-old poly addict Matthew, it seems like a pointless exercise. I don't know, I find this activity really difficult and even a bit wanky. But, um, yeah, I'll see what I can do. This is Matthew's third time in rehab and he's finding it hard going. I've always found this place to be emotional torture. But, you know, I'm a drug addict alcoholic. My natural state is drunk or stoned and I'm not. Like, it's a... It's an odd thing. <laughs> Matthew's desperate to beat his addictions, but he doesn't think writing a letter to them will help him do it. I don't want to give it that kind of respect. And it, it feels like empowering them almost to, um, to, to give them a, a personality that you're writing to and stuff like that. I'll probably just write myself a letter or something. They're always fun when you write yourself a letter and get it six weeks later. Thanks, honey. Uh oh, oh the, the sh hi, Sharon. <laughs> hi, how's he? Oh, That's Sharon! Oh, get your name In rehab, some new arrivals barely make a ripple, but others make a large splash, like Dom. He's an old rocker from the mould of Keith Richards or Ozzy Osbourne. Would you like me to read just the opening bit you call Yeah. <laughs> Dear addiction, addiction, you rancid, insipid, insipid, ugly, maggot-ridden, vomitous, piece of low life, piece of shit, motherfucking. Dom's a hellraiser who likes to be the life of the party. Mental case. Bottle of vodka, bottle of brandy, couple of bottles of chardonnay, six pack of beer, and then I'd get thirsty. When he's on a bender. That's what he drinks in a single session, usually combined with cocaine, heroin or speed. 
But 46-year-old Dom's rock and roll lifestyle is set to end, whether he likes it or not. My liver is three times the size of what it should be. Um, my stomach is rooted. Uh, and then uh, if I don't stop um, using and drinking, um, I'll be dead before April next year. Dom also fears alcohol-related brain damage might stop him doing what he loves best. If I could not play drums again, honestly, I would find some way to kill myself. Which I know sounds pretty drastic and dramatic, but that is a fact. Addictions can be dangerous to health, and they can be just as destructive to relationships. Any minutes, can't wait. Can't wait. That's never more evident than every Sunday at the manor. A happy family, nuclear family. Ooh. Visitors' day. Dad's going to be home for Christmas. Yeah. So we so. Marcello is a proud father. He's also a heroin and alcohol addict. Over the 10 years of their marriage, his wife Carol has watched his addictions escalate. I sort of knew at the beginning, but I just thought he was, I didn't realise how much. It was just, I just thought he was just having fun or he just drank socially, he drank a lot socially. And then it just sort of excelled from there. And then I thought, once we had kids, maybe he'd stop and he'd realise, but no. And then he'd stop and start and stop and start. And keep on going over and over again. But now stopped. But now stopped, yeah. It's just, you know, the hardest thing is, is them. How do you explain to them? Okay. Can you roll it? Oh! You don't, you don't want to tarnish that image of their father because, after all, he is their father. So we just say to them, you know, Daddy's not well and we're trying to fix this. We're trying, we're trying to keep it as normal as possible um, so that it doesn't affect them. But they know, they, they know something, something's wrong. But for years, Carol was too ashamed to tell anyone. It really is hard to, you know, to admit this People need to know about it. And even still, I think as this is going to go to air, people are thinking, look at me and go, what is she talking about? I think people are not going to understand that. Oh, he's a drunk, why didn't you leave? But you, you can't. It, it is so hard once you've given that time, you've had, and you've got two, two children who you know, they adore their father. He's not a bad father. He's not a bad person. But it's just when he drinks, he's this horrible, you know, he's just not the person that you, you thought he was. Wipe your hands on my hands. Addictions erode trust, often leaving the marital bond in tatters. We are, I guess we are separated, um, but we're trying to, you know, I'm trying to help him get over this addiction and then after that see what happens. Um, because if I do leave and take the children away and do that, that he might spiral out of control. Even though we, we're separated, I still want to help him. And who knows, towards the end, maybe if he can find his feet, find his way, get better, then we can regain what we had. But just for the moment, you know, it, I just have to take one day at a time. I know it's funny, it sounds like a, a cliche, you know, one day at a time, but you, that's all you can do. One day at a time. A difficult time, but I just have to stay strong, you know. A lot of, a lot of things to lose, so I'm not going through that shit again, that's for sure. Marcello and the other addicts know that rehab doesn't offer a quick fix cure. During their 28-day program, they need to create a plan on how to manage their addiction. If you've got your plan in place already, you give yourself a much better shot. If they don't, they'll most likely go straight back to using. Addiction is a chronic relaxing disease. Our expectations are that if people walk out the door and do nothing else, that 90% of them are going to relapse within a 12-month period. Yes, I do. The centre offers every addict up to two years support and therapy after they complete their program. And this morning, staff have had a distressing phone call. Yeah. 
One of the addicts who left last week has already been drinking and gambling. It's Denise. It happens a lot, unfortunately, and it's not something that we, we have a huge amount of control over. We kind of give them the tools here, and it's, it's really up to them to, to use those tools when they go back out to the community. In rehab, Denise admitted the devastating effects of gambling and drinking on her life. I lost a lot of money. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of money. Although emotional, at the end of her program, Denise believed she could win her fight against addiction. I'm coming to see that you can come to a place like this, take the messages, start to put it into your life and just resume your life. But Denise's resolve lasted only a matter of minutes. From rehab, she got in a cab and got out at the pub. Many people with addictions are very likely to relapse soon after they leave unless they have in place a very clear structure of what they're going to do, how they're going to go about dealing with the issues that you know, produce the problems in the first place. While Denise appears to have stumbled at the first hurdle, in Mowie, Victoria, fellow recovering addict Mick has had a more positive start. He's organising his return to work. Then what's work-wise? Where he's working? Yeah, wherever. It's here at home with his mum that Mick used to down a bottle of scotch every right, night. Good afternoon. Right, thanks, mate. The routine would be to sit there, smoking cigarettes, read the paper, watch the news, have dinner, do very little else, and off to bed, pass out, do it all again the next day. Very, very tame. In rehab, Mick's withdrawal from alcohol was a physical ordeal. But he got through it by never losing sight of his goal. I've got a picture of um, my niece and nephew. I'm not allowed to see them. Until such time I'm sober, I scare them, apparently. We get on famously, but if they're safe, they're there on a Saturday, over the period of the day, I'll get drunker and drunker and might get louder and louder and a bit rowdy and a bit rougher with them. And I scared them, apparently. They told their father, your brother. Um, and I wasn't aware of that. While at the manor, Mick vowed to get a tattoo to symbolise his new drug and booze-free life. And I'll pick out a few appropriate words and I'll just have it tattooed in Japanese characters on my arm, so it's always there just for me to... to re a reminder. Now back home for just four days, Mick's already fulfilled his promise. Got me tattoo, oh. and that worked out perfect. Embrace enlightenment and overcome life's journey. So I struck while the iron was hot there, don't muck around. Mick lives with his mum, Joyce. One of the reasons he wanted to get sober was so he could take better care of her. When, when he, he said to me one day, no. just a few months ago, Sit down, I want to talk to you. So I sat down and he said, he had a cry and said he was an alcoholic. I said, well, I'm glad you said that because we, Dad and I thought you were, but it was no good us saying anything until you admitted it. So once he admitted it, it was all right. I said, well, we can help you. We'll help you as much as we can. Living with an alcoholic son has been a huge burden for Joyce, but she stood by him through thick and thin. There's never been any intention of any kicking any of the kids out for one reason or another. That's not... That's not family... ..family stuff at all, mm. is it? So we just have to put up with you, don't we? We can always shuffle you off to a nursing home too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready for a nursing home yet. Mm, we'll put that to a vote. <laughs> you don't think so? No. Joyce is housebound, so Mick does the grocery shopping. That's when he faces the strongest temptations. Normally I come down and do shopping. I use shopping as my excuse. Run around and do lotto, grab a couple of things for, for lunch during the week, go to the butcher, that sort of thing. Head to the tavern. Just straight in, wouldn't even have to ask and knew what I was getting anyway. First time I've thought about having a drink, actually. What, what 
what sort of what setting of your head talking about it? Oh, with a light being in there at the moment. Only because I've had the air conditioning done recently. It'd be the only reason to get out of the sun. Likely. <laughs> Meanwhile, in another country town 300 kilometres away, Polly Attic James is already back on the job. I was straight back into work, straight busy straight away, which kept my mind occupied, which is good. If I if I had had like two weeks off or something, I wouldn't have done good. I would have I would have relapsed. I reckon definitely. I was in denial with my drug addiction for a very long time. James began rehab as an angry 22-year-old with a dangerous drug habit. I liked any sort of drug I could really get my hands on. To tell you the truth, didn't feel normal if I wasn't stoned or high on something. But when his parents came to visit him in rehab just three weeks later, James seemed a new man. His acceptance or his attitude has changed dramatically. Changed. Now back home in Shepparton, James is surrounded by reminders of the dangerous life he was living. I could, have, I could see myself in cars like that all the time when I was drinking. Shit, yeah. I was wondering about if the person survived out of that. And, um, yeah, no, he didn't. And his daughter come in every day for two weeks or something, just coming and just looking at the car and then going home. James is trying to put his bad boy ways behind him, but not everyone's been supportive of the new direction his life is taking. I've had people come in here that I knew that I've used drugs with, and, like, they've asked me, Come on, come on, let's, what are you doing tonight? Let's go, yeah. And I've had to say, no, no, I can't, I don't drink or I don't do drugs anymore. And they're like, what? Like, they can't get it through their head that I'm not gonna do that anymore. James's recovery might lose him some friends, but in rehab, he made a new one in fellow addict Tim. He's settling into a house for recovering addicts in Melbourne. I'll never forget my whole experience there. It was just, um, I went in there a real mess, really, and came out of it a different person. I feel like a different person. Thirty-two-year-old Tim was hooked on an opiate-based cough medicine. You take it in large enough doses, and it's um, very effective at achieving a high. You just won't contact anyone throughout the day and just have this, you know, be in a little bubble, yeah. you know. In rehab, Tim dealt with some of his demons. Now he hopes to start a new life, drug-free. This is where this, where all the stuff I've learned needs to be put into action. So it's um, going to be a test, a big test, but I'm looking forward to it just the same. <laughs> The manor operates 24 hours a day. Where's the swage up? Tonight, GP Ben Baresi is on duty. Sorry. Uh, you want me to go and grab Jessica for you? That would be yeah. a good idea. OK, I'll go and grab her for you. And his first task is a consultation with one of the new arrivals. 35-year-old Jessica has been in rehab before. But that hasn't made settling in any easier. I just can't believe that I'm here and, you know, that this is happening. It's all... I suppose it was very overwhelming when I first came in. You know, I hung pretty wasted. And then by the time I straightened up, the shock of it <laughs> started to see in. Oh, my God! This is a nightmare. Oh, I feel like a fish out of water. Mm. So Jessica's been haunted by drug dependence since high school, having already overcome addictions to heroin, ice and speed. She now wants to be rid of the latest drug in her life, marijuana. But the reality is I really want to change my life and I've worked so hard to get away from my big using it and I've done it, you know, and if I've given up heroin, I know I can give this up. Mm. I just have to do the things that I need to do to get myself there. 
In her whole adult life, Jessica can't recall a period when she wasn't battling an addiction. When I was first in detox, I was told, like, you know, you're so young, you just got to get out of this, rah, rah, rah. You know, one day you wake up, you know, you're 18 today, you'll be 35 tomorrow, and you just won't know what's happened. And that has really happened to me, and it has hit me hard. Let there be light, let there be rock. The manner's approach to addiction is not to simply treat the disease, it's to address its underlying causes. Therapists here believe most addicts use to cope with painful memories or emotions. Today, Dom will take the first step towards bringing those issues to the surface by telling his life story to the group. OK. I'm going to start by saying Dominic, alcoholic, drug addict, rampant drug addict, rampant alcoholic, womaniser, dyslexic, sexually assaulted, will start for me. So I grew up in a family of six, including mum and dad, youngest of four. From early childhood, Dom's first love was music. It also provided his entree into the world of drugs. I actually started playing, playing professionally when I was 15. So they basically had to sneak me into pubs and stuff. And of course, that's when I first snorted um, speed. Uh, and it was all there, you know. While other kids were doing their homework, so Dom was doing drugs and drinking. And I'd get to a certain point when I'd be pissed. And if something went wrong or awry, like I'd take you all on, right? wouldn't care of the ramifications, like all of you. You know, just, come on, I'll take you all on. Not good and not healthy. After school, Which Dom's career as a professional muso like took off there. and he was playing up to 10 gigs a week. I, just, I remember I discussed with my dad, he said to me one day, he said, you know, look, you're young and beautiful and all of that. He said, but one day it's all going to end, you know? And uh, he said, if you thought about doing something else, just in case, and I thought, yeah, you know, he's a, he was a fucking great man. Dom took the advice and trained to be a chef, but he continued his rock and roll lifestyle. And Dad died in 1990, which is really full on. It was fucking devastating. Um, and I think about him every day, you know. I started using heroin then, just up the ante, basically. Because right through the 80s, essentially, I just used a lot of um, coke and a lot of speed. But Dom's body couldn't cope, and before he knew it, he hit rock bottom. And I went from 93 kilos to 59 kilos, like, really quickly, like, months. Like, I was violently, violently ill. So it finally caught up with me, basically. Well, this is what I thought. The doctor said, you're not going to survive. So... But Dom did survive, and he stopped using booze and hard drugs for four years, until the end of a relationship triggered a relapse. She gave me like this two-minute speech. Basically, it was all over, Red Rover. Last thing she said to me was, please don't go to your, your dealer or the bottle shop. So I got in my car, I went straight to my dealers, went to the bottle -o. Here we go again. In the last 12 months, Dom suffered seizures, broken bones, spinal injuries and multiple head wounds, all caused by his drinking and taking drugs. And what I've learned since is, with my liver being three times the size, I should actually technically be dead anyway. But I'm not. Sometimes the manners rules about no mobile phones or personal music players are relaxed to make clients feel more at home. Polyaddict Matthew has been allowed his MP3 player. Because it was here in a package yesterday. But today, it can't be found. I was, I was like, that parcel I was relying on that, like, to make me feel like as, as a coping mechanism to get my MP3 player. So that could have changed everything. 
It might seem like a minor issue, but for Matthew, it's a big deal. I've got borderline personality disorder, so I get um, emotional reactions to things that probably most people wouldn't. Matthew's found the going tough in rehab, and this could be the final straw. Meanwhile, Dom's taking some time alone. His life story has brought some painful truths to the surface. You know, I played professionally and I cooked, you know, in some very exclusive places and had some great opportunities. So I've been lucky in that regard. It's just that I've been off my fucking banana most of the time. And every relationship I've had has basically been butchered by, um, you know, been butchered by that. As a young man, Dom wore booze and drugs as a badge of honour. Now, after a week in rehab, he can see the destruction they have caused. Just um, life just completely unmanageable. Not being able to hold down a job and forgetting that I had a gig on. And it's too much. It's, it's just a myriad of appalling behaviour. I shouldn't laugh, but... Many might write off Dom's addictions as plain old rock and roll excess, but they have a deeper cause. Because I know what triggered me. I was sexually assaulted by someone uh, within the church when I was 14. Over 30 years later, Dom's still feeling the effects of that incident. And the only way he's found to forget the abuse is by using drugs and alcohol. Everyone is responsible for their own behaviour, but, you know, I can look you in the eye and say, basically, I still have reoccurring nightmares, you know? But when I get completely shit-faced, I don't have those nightmares. For addicts who aren't in the right frame of mind, rehab can be unbearable. I can't really, I can't cope anymore. Midway through his program, Matthews had enough. Um, How long did you last, last time you I've came? done it both times. This is the first time I've, the first time I've left early. The missing package has tipped him over the edge. But the real reason he's calling it quits is that he doesn't feel accepted by the group. I, I don't want to stay when when nobody wants me to talk, you know? What am I supposed to do? Like, if I was um, afflicted with verbal diarrhoea or the stuff I was saying was inappropriate or um, if I actually was trying to take over and, and things like that, then I, I could, you know, I, hopefully I could see my behaviour and say, well, that needs to change. But I'm actually sure that it's okay, but but if the whole group is just going to turn on me for it, then I can't, I don't want to be here. Like, I, I won't feel comfortable opening my mouth and what's the point? And, um, the last thing Matthew has to do is organise his accommodation outside. He calls a homeless refuge and books a bed for the night. Hi. Trying to sort out accommodation? Yeah. How's it looking? Yeah, good. Sounds good. What sort of place are you going to go to? Um, it's a homeless place, but it's the place that I was planning on going to after here anyway. They, apparently there's, a, you know, like big rooms and locked door and you know, share bathroom with one other person and um, there's a lot of support there to help you find other housing and stuff like that. So, yeah, sounds good. And it's not here. Yeah. For recovering addicts, boredom can be a trigger to start using again. So 22-year-old James is keeping busy by helping out on his stepdad's hobby farm. I don't know if I'd be a full-time farmer, because it's a pretty big job. But yeah, I, I enjoy it. So far, the biggest threat to James's recovery hasn't been his own thoughts. It's been the attitude of others. I uh, found out on the weekend that half of the people that I used to hang out with 
are all pissed off with me because I don't drink anymore or take drugs. Like, when I say pissed off, I mean to the point that they want to fight me because of it. Like, I can't understand that. It's childish, stupid stuff. For support, James has been turning to those who went through rehab with him, like his friend Tim. Keep in contact with Tim. We just got along so well, it's amazing. Yeah. We went through the whole, whole 28 days side by side. It was really good. Um, I was going to go down and see him on the weekend, actually, but he ended up doing something else. I don't know what he was doing. James will be shocked when he finds out what his friend has been up to. Two weeks since Tim left, he's back in rehab. I was going to an NA meeting and it was like my head was on autopilot and took me to the left, going down Victoria Street, and I went and scored within a matter of 10 minutes. And I thought, I'll just do this once. And then the next day came and I woke up. And I thought, oh, let's do it again. Before I knew it, eight days had passed that I was doing it and I was doing it every day. I knew that I was heading for trouble. I knew that I was just going down the wrong path and I had to pull up. Tim's moved on from opiate-based cough medicine to heroin, and not even he understands why. Addiction is the hardest thing I've ever faced in my life. Um, and the compl I've never dealt with something as complex as this that affects my daily life the way that it does. And I think it's like that for all of us. Mm. It's really fucking hard. Mm. And it's with me for life, you know? It's the cards that have been dealt. It's the cards we've all been dealt in this place. So... Many people with addictions have great trouble moving on and they get stuck with resentment, they get stuck with guilt, they get stuck with anxiety, they get stuck with depression and if they can blot that all out with alcohol or drugs they at least get temporary relief. That keeps the cycle of relapse growing. To halt that cycle, addicts must confront the shame and resentment that drives their addiction. That's what marijuana addict Jessica will be doing today when she tells her life story. Absolutely freaking out because I guess I'm ashamed of a lot of what I've done and my behaviour and the drug addiction's horrific. And, um, yeah, I've done everything I can to hide my, the inside of myself from people and now I'm going to have to um, get honest and unmask it with everybody, but I think it will be to my advantage in the long run. Jessica's about to reveal some truths about her addiction she's never told anyone before. Hi, my name is Jessica and I'm an addict and I'm going to tell you something about my life story. Like many other addicts, Jessica believes her problems began with a traumatic event in her childhood. I think mum and dad really did the best they could, but what really went wrong for me is at about the age, somewhere between eight and ten, um, I was sexually abused. And that was what really screwed me up. There. While at pains to point out her sexual abuse was not by a member of her immediate family, Jessica believes the assault on her young self set off an emotional chain reaction. I didn't have the way to express it. I didn't have the words. I was so young. I didn't know what sex was. And it just completely it ruined everything. And I Jessica I was a troubled teen. When she was first exposed to hard drugs at 17, they seemed to offer an escape. So, of course, when I found the speed, I was seriously depressed, I was suicidal, I had this eating disorder. It just solved all my problems like that. But and soon, Jessica had a different problem on her hands, addiction. Within two weeks, I was gone. I was an addict, basically. 
within six months I was using over 10 grams of fuel state a day. And I used to sleep once a week. I looked over 40, I looked older than I did now. It was just, I had police after me left, right and centre. It was an absolute nightmare. I had Jessica moved deeper day. into the nightmare, swapping speed for heroin. She and her best friend would each inject $700 worth of the drug every day. And then, of course, she OD'd in the toilets at McDonald's at Oakley and died a week before her 23rd birthday. And that's her ring I've worn every day since to remind me that I'm not going to go the same way. And, um... That was very hard. Yeah, I'll never forget that moment. I just, yeah, I, it just all hit me at once. Like, for some reason before then, dying of drugs just didn't really mean anything. And I think I sort of got it then. And Since she I buried her friend 12 years ago, Jessica has never injected heroin or speed again, but she replaced them with cocaine, ecstasy, ice, and marijuana. Even though I'd been able to sort of get away from the IV using, I was fully having to compensate. And of course, all this is going on while I'm having this mental stuff happening that of course, nobody could really help me with because I was taking all these drugs. So they couldn't diagnose me properly. They couldn't treat me properly. I wouldn't follow the treatment. Um, yeah, it was terrible and um, yeah, yeah, I got into the like two thirds of addicts, Jessica has underlying psychiatric disorders. And um, because I've been so ashamed of myself and of what I've done, I've basically thrown away every opportunity that I've had in life. Particularly now that I'm um, 35, I thought I would have, you know, been off the drugs, had a family, had kids by now, and of course I haven't. So I feel like that's another opportunity that. Um, I've thrown away and but you know I have to remind myself that I'm still here and that life is a journey and that we all have lessons to learn that's it in the past Jessica has tried to keep her story of addiction a secret bringing it out into the open should help her accept it and move on I really feel I've turned a very big corner. And um, I, I know, before I didn't know what, I, what kind of life I wanted, who I was, where I was going, what on earth was going on around me. I was so caught up in the world and all its problems. And um, now I think I'm far more focused on myself and what I want in my life, which is to be healthy, to have a family, and to be a contributing member of society. Sometimes, yeah, people but one of the addicts didn't attend Jessica's life story. An unusually subdued Dom has been to a specialist to test his brain function. Yeah. But what are they testing for? What are they concerned about? Because I've smashed my head so many times and all the, all the gear and all the, all, the, all the booze and all the drugs that I've put into my system, with all the smashing of my head open and whatnot and falling down and um, just as concerned, frontal lobe, all of that kind of stuff. And do you know what frontal lobe damage means? Yeah, I do. I do know what it means. What you it mean? have a high susceptibility of uh, getting angry. Yeah. Which I don't need to be exacerbated any more than it already is. So. Dom's also worried he might be losing the motor skills that enable him to play drums. Thanks for the call. Bye. But he'll have to wait a week for the results. I'm going to go and shower and lie down now. Oh, Goodbye, Helen. As Dom already knows, addictions take their toll on the human body. And the rehab's exercise sessions are designed to coax muscles and organs back into better working order. <laughs> Alcohol and heroin addict Marcello is hoping they might also help him keep up with his young kids. But Joshua here, yeah, my beautiful boy, is a, is a handful because he's got so much energy and having a girl first and she's such a beautiful, placid girl. I've got this little tiger who just runs around and runs and runs and runs. 
Then it has to run out for more cow, you know, but it's, it's good. As a father and a husband, Marcello knows he has a huge incentive to beat his addictions. I'm determined to do it this time, I have to for the kids. I want the kids much longer. I'm not going to miss out anymore. Um, head down here, and a righty at the end. In Maui, Mick has an appointment with his psychologist. He last saw Mary Ellen the day before he went into rehab, but he doesn't remember what happened. He arrived at a five o'clock appointment of a Monday night, and he was just so drunk. And the, like, the sweat was just pouring off him. He was reeking of alcohol. And he just was crying, saying, I have to do something, this is it now, or I'm going to do something terrible to myself. And I don't want to. And so, I, don't remember. It was the I don't want to. And that's when I thought, this is it. I've got to get him in somewhere. Mary Ellen knew Mick had to go to rehab immediately. He was suicidal and the niece and nephew he loved had become scared of him because of his drinking. They're important, aren't they, in this? Oh, yeah, they were sort of a, a reason behind going. And I remember that even from the last time we were in, you were virtually totally incoherent. Mm -hmm. that, that still came through, you know. Yeah. Like, I have to do something, Mary Ellen, and I have to be able to see those kids. Though he's not yet reconnected with his brother's children, Mick's made a good start to his recovery. Thank you, I'll go make that appointment. Thank you. But the first month is still a vulnerable time. Excellent. As fellow addict Denise knows all too well, she's living in a shelter for homeless women. It's 19 days since she finished rehab and took a cab straight to the pub. I went into the place and, um, yeah, I did gamble a bit. It filled in the time. But since then, nothing's happened. And what about drinking? Because you're in a pub No, again? not at all. No. I just can't afford to do anything like that anymore. It's just got me into so much trouble. But, um, yeah. Can you turn it on? I, I think... While the camera was switched off, Denise admitted she did drink that day. I think it was actually, it's going to sound weird, but it was a wee bit courageous on my part because, yeah, they got the phone calls back at VAC, they got the phone calls here. I did it anyway, and I've, the next day was just a normal day anyway. You lot can all panic. I just went into a place and I sat down and I had a drink and I lost money. And um, it was bad, but I stopped the next day and I've gone on with the things I was going to do anyway. Rather than a full-blown return to her addiction, Denise has experienced what is known in rehab as a lapse. A lapse is, is falling over. If you stay there and wait for someone to come along and pick you up or you lie there and, and, and don't get yourself up, then you turn it into a relapse. That's how I look at it, yeah? So um, with Denise, hers was a bit of a lapse, but she's pulled herself up and hopefully has learned something from that and, you, and will be using the, the skills that she's gained here and got herself back on track. So that's great and I think that's really positive. Rehab experts are quick to point out that addiction is an incurable disease and therefore a lapse like Denise's shouldn't be considered a failure. They say the best way to judge the success of her recovery is to look at her quality of life and how long her periods of abstinence last. What you're attempting to do is to stretch out the time between relapses and achieve long-term stability, not a cure. Back at the manor, it's a busy morning in the nurses' station. Staff are planning the upcoming relocation to a new facility in Richmond, allowing better coordination of the client's addiction and psychiatric treatment. Well, I think we're, go we're going to be moving over there um, the 3rd of December. And here's the plan. 
That's our nurse's station there. While the nurses are preparing for the move, one of the addicts is coming to terms with some sobering news. Dom's heard the results of his brain scan. Basically, uh, what did she say? She said, uh, there's a high propensity for uh, neuro dysfunction. Like, you know, can't eat, you know, can't coordinate, wouldn't be able to play at all. So, so they said that had happened and then you just, anything could happen. Your liver could explode, you could explode, you could bleed internally. There's just some plethora of things that can go wrong. So it's kind of like, hello, McFly, anybody home, you know? So at least it's good now that I understand and, yeah. No more drinks for this little black sheep. Visitor's Day has come around again. And a familiar face has returned to the manor. James has driven almost three hours to see Tim. An awesome thing to do. Tim rang me and he goes, guess what? I said, what? He goes, I'll relapse. I went, Fuck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is it <you> No, <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Did the car go on? Oh! <laughs> shattered. The visit means a lot to Tim, and he thinks James's support might be just what he needs to avoid another relapse. People have been quite sedate or quite tame with me, really. It sounds like he's got people. Look, I've got the support, I've got a lot of support, but I don't have people saying, don't you fucking touch that shit, you know, like... I'll tell you. Yeah, I know, you'll <laughs> tell me. That's good, I've got him to tell me then. Bloody oath, I'll ring him up every day and say, oi, don't you fucking dare <laughs> come down there and slap you. <laughs> On Visitor's Day, many addicts think about reconnecting with their family. Or in the case of Jessica and her partner Dean, starting one of their own. I am going to be 36 in January. I'm 35 now, though. Heading towards 40s is really quite scary. And I really want to have a family, but I refuse to have one on drugs. I really need to deal with all of it, not just the dope smoking, not just the methadone, but the whole thing to give my child the best chance that it possibly has in life because life is really hard enough as it is <laughs> you know you don't need to be adding to it and I don't think that I'll be able to be a good mother and be there for them if I'm in active addiction I just won't be able to. Addiction has already destroyed Jessica's other dreams only time will tell if it will close the door on this one too. Visitor's day is over. James is beginning the drive home, leaving his friend Tim in rehab. It's good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Cool it's... friendship you two have had. Yeah, I feel a bit sad, actually. But, um, yeah, it's close friendship. Um, just glad that he's gonna, you know, keep on my case, you know, and make sure that I'm gonna be good from now on. Well, it's not a matter of being good or bad or anything like that, but you know what I mean about, you know, just staying clean. Yeah, it's really important, so... And I really value that in somebody that is willing to be that caring, somebody that cares that much to actually, you know, say, right, well, I will fucking call you, you know, if that's what it takes to... And I will come down, if that's what it takes to come all the way down from Shep to travel two and a half hours to stop me from lapsing. Yeah, it's really... Ooh.
It's the last day of rehab in the manor. Looking forward to our move, I think it'll be a, a good thing and uh, just winding down and getting prepared to move, really. Yeah, exciting times ahead. Staff and clients are joining forces to help relocate the centre. The addicts will continue their program at a new facility in Richmond, but Dom won't be joining them. Welcome to... Welcome to my humble shithole. He's finished his 28 days and moving back into the room he rents in a boarding house. It's not where he thought he'd be at age 46. Married, children, shipping, playing music, mortgage, picket fence. This, <laughs> this is where I've ended up. But Dom's thankful he can still do what he loves best. His band, The April Tree, are filming a video. The boys in my rock and roll world are non-drinkers, non-smokers. So that's a safe environment for me. Playing music and getting wasted used to go hand in hand for Dom, but he knows he can't go down that road again. I've been at it for 31 years, but the body said, it's enough, Dom. Fuck, we had a ball. You've created some havoc. But that's it. Back at the manor, the move to Richmond is being celebrated as a chance to start afresh. The addicts write farewell messages on balloons. I just want to move on from it. It's in the past and I want it to stay in the past. I don't want it to be running my life like it has been. It's a lot of willpower, you know, a lot of positive thinking. Just take it day by day and then just see how we go. I mean, it should be right. Marcello, Jessica and the others in rehab are on the path to greater understanding of why they do what they do. And I want to wish you all well. All the addicts are hoping one day they'll step out of the shadow of their addiction. It's a dream that former Manor resident Mick is already living. Stop drinking. Yes, he's happy. <laughs> Not straight at all, have you? I'm doing good, I think. I think. I think I'm doing good. You don't think, you know. I oh, know I'm doing good. Thank you, mate. <laughs>